AFI. recruitment there are all kinds of superheroes some are faster than a speeding train some fly some are strong others use their brain and some superheroes are so special that they're hard to explain these superheroes face challenges that a lot of people don't understand when they try to do new or different things it doesn't always go as planned these superheroes are very sensitive and get overwhelmed in busy places. They might have difficulty concentrating in noisy and crowded spaces. When these superheroes have an understanding super friend or two, they know plans won't always be perfect, but together there's nothing that they can't do. Thank you again to Switch Animation for sponsoring these events and all of our events. Your ongoing support is greatly appreciated and much needed. Let's get to the panel, shall we? Moderating tonight's panel is the incredible Lance Laporte. Lance is the president of Laporte Talent Group, a management consulting firm to digital entertainment companies internationally. He has held progressive positions in this career, encompassing talent, operations, and HR management in the video game, animation, and VFX studios. Don't forget to post your questions in the live stream on the side. We will be choosing one lucky winner from those participating to win a free access pass to Taffy's upcoming digital conference, Taffy Industry. Lance, take it away. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, good evening, everybody. Since COVID-19 started shutting down most physical studios in early 2020, employers, employees, HR team, job seekers, we've all had to adapt to the changing times. For many production studios, work from home was a rare option or not an option at all for various departments. Um, but within a few short weeks in March, April, many studios rushed their employees and contractors home uh, to set up home offices and keep projects rolling for their clients. Listen to our panel of senior executives, producers, HR reps discuss the changes and some of the new measures that people have put in place and companies have put in place during the pandemic's first six to eight months of impact. Let me introduce our panelists today. I'll go alphabetically by last names. Scarlett Dangerfield is the VP of Talent Development for High res Studios, where she fulfills the company's staffing and human development needs. High res produces a range of highly successful games for multiple platforms. Prior to High res she worked with Xaviant and CCP. Scarlett brings to high res 15 years of progressive global human resource and recruiting experience with a passion for the games industry. Our next panelist, Kyle McDougall, is president of Jamfield, a premier full service animation company that partners with creators, producers, brands, and broadcasters in both 2D and CG content across all platforms, all genres. Kyle began uh, working in the video game industry, advertising and television industries. He worked as initially as an artist, became a producer, entrepreneur, and ultimately a studio builder, opening locations in several cities in Canada, and they have a pres presence in Los Angeles as well. Jamfield produces multiple shows that are seen on Netflix, Nickelodeon, and many other broadcasters. Our third panelist, Nicola Smith. Nicola is the VP of Talent Acquisition at Visual Concepts, known for many successful game titles, including NBA 2K and WWE. Overseeing the recruitment of top talent across studios globally, she ensures a world-class experience for candidates during the interview process and beyond. Nicola has extensive experience within the games industry, starting with her own recruitment company in the UK during the 90s. She has been and seen 
many, many changes in the industry. And after moving to the U.S., Nikola has been helping companies to build out their talent and their teams to achieve their best production results. Last, only alphabetically, is Rebecca Swift. As VP of Production at House of Cool in Toronto, Rebecca Swift leads all service production work from the initial pitch to delivery. She oversees the operations of the studio and manages a team of 70 plus artists and production staff. Rebecca is also an instrumental force in strategic planning for House of Cool, lending her expertise to IP development, marketing, and finance. She's had great success at both live action and digital animation, having been involved in award-winning original IP and selling shows to major networks. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to take audience uh, questions at the end, if we have some time. As uh, Karen uh, uh, alluded to earlier, there's a chat uh, panel at the side. Please drop your questions in there, and Karen will uh, collect those as we go along. Without further ado, I'd like to kick off our first question, and I'm going to target uh, it towards the two talent acquisition specialists on the panel, Nicola, Scarlett. From your experience, how has COVID-19 changed the recruitment process since early March 2020? Well, I can I can step in uh, for us. Obviously, everything went from uh, you know after the initial recruiting uh, phone screen with a recruiter to what would have been an on-site to redesigning the whole process. So we now do everything online via Zoom calls. Um, so from from the interview to the offer process is is all done online and uh, you know that that includes technical interviewing as well so we had to uh, we talked to lots of companies about introducing uh, a technical platform testing um, uh, software but actually we 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 designed our own and we do it sort of like on our proprietary um, tool so for us that's that that was the biggest change is not bringing anyone on site, meeting people in person, just to do it all over Zoom. Right, right. Scarlett's similar or different? Yeah, decently similar. Our process previously was pretty um, uh, able to be done uh, remotely. So we would normally do a recruiter phone screening. We do a test for all positions. Then you have a call with the hiring manager, and then we would go to on site. So it sounds like a pretty similar process. Um, so we had to kind of revamp what our on site looked like because normally it would invo involve like getting them out to see the area, meeting the team. Um, usually we have like a technical screening as well, like while they're physically on site. So just trying to figure out different ways where we can overcome those hurdles. Um, now it's a lot more of us trying to get them more information about moving to Georgia, where our headquarters is or our Brighton office or one of our other offices ahead of time. So then if they do have questions on kind of what is it like locally to live and work in these areas, we can give them that information too, since they don't give it a chance of seeing that in person. Great. Right. Okay. Um, Kyle, Rebecca, has the experience been different or similar or either one jump in? Uh, similar. I mean, I think you can imagine moving a big operation um, from pre-production all the way through to comp and post and move people to uh, a work from home situation. Remote desktop, Charadishi solutions, those are things we got in place pretty quickly. Um, and it was it was a big big move making sure that people had the hardware that they needed to have at home. There was an awful lot of juggling that took place, but the teams did an amazing job to sort of make that happen. But it's it was a uh, it was a challenge for sure. Yeah, yeah. And Re Rebecca, don't does House of Cool quite often have remote like storyboard artists? And I'm just curious what the mix would be. Was it was it uh, yeah. everyone's running home to set up, or some people are already home, or we do have some artists that are working remotely, mostly international artists, but a majority of our staff are in studio with us. So we still had to make that big move as well. Um, and part of what makes House of Cool House of Cool is that we're all in the same house. We're all in the same home. And so suddenly being separated is really challenging and hiring people in that environment, exactly what Scarlett and Nicholas said, like it, it is a challenge. You're on a Zoom call maybe two, three, four times before you make a decision to hire somebody. 
and you maybe repeat the same questions or have different people in the meeting and some people are really uncomfortable over Zoom. So maybe you try a phone call. Sometimes that doesn't work. So now at least we're kind of in the position where we can start to bring some people in studio and have a face-to-face -face discussion and um, still continue to also rely a lot on word of mouth and talking to students that have uh, friends that have just graduated that they loved working with that they thought were really great or um, artists at the studio that have mentored new people in the industry and looking to them as sort of like the first step into the door. Right, right, great. Okay, um, I'm curious to them from the group, um, some positives because, um, you know, I think initially there was sort of shock, how are we going to do this, everyone was scrambling. Um, and I remember talking to a few studios earlier in the spring and one producer said, shockingly, we're we three days ahead of schedule now <laughs> on a project that, uh, and I, you know, potentially the early days, no one was going out and no one was venturing outside their houses. So people were maybe doing more work from home. But um, I'm curious if that or other, you know, uh, realizations after now that we've been doing this for several months, it's not fresh and new anymore. Are there, from your, from the perspective of the panel, some areas where this has accelerated things or been beneficial? Uh, I, I would say for us, the process has definitely got faster and more efficient. So it's, you know, we, we really kind of, we, we, we got it down, if you like, as far as, you know, we're going to Zoom interview, the panel has the interview plan, it's all set up before everyone knows what they're doing. And it's just, it's much quicker, right? It's much quicker. You don't have the studio tour or the lunch or, you know, the other things that take up a lot of time when you have someone on site. So for, for us, I would say that the process is much, much quicker and the costs are lower because right. I'm not having to fly people in or, um, you know, hotel costs. So that has, you know, been beneficial on my budget. Uh, yeah. But, you know, and you get you, you get a larger pool of candidates. Right. So our, our net has got a lot bigger because we are now employing people remotely from all over, all over. So yeah. they those are some of my pros. Right, great. Scarlett, similar? Uh, yeah, I would definitely echo the yeah. efficiency in the recruitment process, which normally would be a they arrive at 10 in the morning and they usually don't leave the office until about four or five in the afternoon, where it's now down to probably we get on this uh, Hangouts call usually around one and they're usually done by one or by three or four. So that's been pretty beneficial. I think also we've always had a handful of people working remotely for our studios. So I think that's something that some of our managers have always had a bit of a comfort level with. Uh, but on the flip side, I think this has given our entire management base the experience of having to manage someone that's not physically right beside them. And I think their comfort level now is much more high. It's much higher, sorry. So the idea of having someone that's not physically in our studio, maybe they're working from one of our other studios or maybe they are just working from home is I think a, an easier conversation for us to bring up with the hiring managers than what it was beforehand. Mm -hmm. Great. That's okay. huge. If, if I can jump in, yeah. just that trust factor of people that maybe were hesitant to work with remote people before are now actually really open to the idea because everybody's doing it. So they're like, well, we may as well try. And so yeah. it's nice to be able to have those open conversations and open up, like Nicholas saying, like the talent pool, because now we can kind of entertain uh, different people that maybe wouldn't be entertained before. So that's definitely a pro. Right, right. Kyle, anything to add? Yeah, I would say when it comes to sort of management supervision and any sort of lead roles, I think communication has actually improved. You know, we're touching base on a much more regular basis. I think that that was because of the the nature of having to transition so many people into a work from home situation, there was an awful lot to be on top of. And so I think that there was that big adrenaline rush that everybody had and it was great. You know, I think everybody was touching base, everybody's following up, following through uh, with trying to make sure that people didn't fall between the cracks um there's an awful lot of people everybody's situation is a little bit different at home and i you know I'm, I'm proud that the teams were able to sort of manage those 
individuals and the people that were struggling to make sure that they were being heard and that they their needs were being met. And um, so communication, I think, improved uh, more than anything else when it comes to making sure that we were touching base with people. Hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, and you touched on something about, you know, working from home and everyone's situation was different. And as we all know, uh, you know, children have been in the house and <laughs> homeschooling. And so that's added a a wild dynamic that I, I don't think anyone was really sort of conceptually on board until it hit, you know, and then it was like, wow. And um, so I'm curious, how are some of the studios managing the workflow? Because I've, I've heard from some married couples where one of the spouses will manage the children for most of the day while the other one works and then they flip late in the day. And so, you know, how does that impact work schedules and communication schedules and meetings? And anyone jump in on that? I'm curious to see what, what you've done to sort of tackle those sort of things. Call it a family environment, very <laughs> family friendly, where you're going to have uh, the furry family, uh, cats, dogs, Right. Uh, they're going to be in the mix. You're going to see kids coming on screen on a regular basis, spouses, partners. Um, uh, it's it's an awful lot. I think that the biggest thing is you you have to be a lot more easygoing about uh, interruptions and noise and just work through it because that you know it's it's the new norm that all of this stuff is going to be happening while you're trying to get your stuff done. Right. Right. Yeah. Life happens. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else want to add on that? Or Yeah, I think just talk, I mean, from a production perspective, it's, you know, talking to those people that, you know, don't have the best scenario at home and they ha are interrupted, whether, you know, the multitude of things. And can we adjust the day? Can we change your priorities? Can we change what your responsibilities are maybe for a certain amount of time? Do we need to bring on more people because you can only do so much and, yeah, definitely being flexible, being open, communicating, and like uh, allowing that personal side to come through. And let's not all pretend we're not in this situation. Let's embrace it and and see what we can do to make the most of it. And um, I think it's it's worked okay. I think it's a constant change, and especially as we went into school now and. Everyone is really different between kids being in school and not and. Now we do have people back in our studio. So some people are in studio and some people are not. It's just constantly evolving and changing and and just talking about what's working and not what's not working, making mistakes and trying again. Sure. I definitely I definitely know my team a bit better now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, things that uh, you not you wouldn't necessarily discuss in the studio uh, on a normal work day. It, anything goes and I actually love that I think mm. it's a really right. nice environment and people feel much more relaxed right excellent okay great um, so uh, one of my questions I'm always curious about you know when I was a HR director we often talk about various metrics and one of them is retention you know turnover and retention and how are we not only attracting people to the brand or the studio but how are we keeping them there and, and as we all know, generally, if, if people go through two or three crunch cycles or crazy deadlines, uh, they end up bonding. You know, it's kind of like a tour of Nam in my head. It's like, yeah, you know, Saigon, 60, whatever, you know. Like, and so they recall these projects or these deadlines that they were on uh, romantically almost years later. Nostalgically, they talk about, oh, do you remember that thing? And we were up till three in the morning. And so this is my curiosity with the remote setup. How do we look at that change um, where the teams are not bonding together the same way. They're not all in the same environment. So um, are you doing things to mitigate that or add structure in places or that glue or, you know, how do we bond the teams together in that way? Um, anyone want to jump in on that? Curious. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is making sure teams feel connected. And the way that we've done that is set up virtual rooms that you can come and go whenever you want. It's not work related and just feel connected. I, I do a, a daily huddle every, every morning with my team, just 10 minutes, 
to get the day started, talk about what's going on that day. And I think that's really important for them. Virtual lunches, really, really important. And, uh, you know, they love the happy hours. That's also very important. It's all, it's all about keeping connected and communication strong. Thank goodness for internal, you know, Slack channels. That, that's really important. But also, you know, having this available to teams, I'm often, you know, I, I'm on this all day. But it's really, really important that my team in particular feels that they, they have that outlet and they, they stay connected to each other and to me. Because you can you can lose so much being or working remotely, so um, I think the, the the take the take here the take out here is you know just make sure you stay connected with your teams. Right. right. I think uh, I'll add a little bit to it. One of the the challenges that with all of the relationships um, that were already in place before COVID before March. I think that it was a situation where you have that history together, you work closely together, but we've hired 250 people since we moved to a work from home situation. Wow. And you get into a situation of like, okay, how do we, how do we find opportunities to develop those relationships, those friendships? Um, that's usually the glue uh, in your studio when you talk about retention. Um, the challenges that you walk through, uh, atmosphere, culture, how do you impart that in a remote setting? These are challenges. And I think that, you know, we're going to continue to get better at it and we're still working through it, but you know, you're trying to find different social opportunities. Um, there's the day-to-day -day sort of communication that happens, but it's, it's something that I think all of us in a remote setting are, are going to have to continue to get better at, but it's, it's a big part. It is a challenge for sure. Right. I can think of years ago, studios having like in the winter, uh, like a skating party, ice skating, yeah. or, you know, uh, food trucks and barbecues. And even uh, we did a dog event once for all the uh, dog owners in the studio to get together and do a big dog walk. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what unique ideas come up with, you know, people coming up with uh, uh, some some ingenuity around this, I would imagine, um, you know, design a really cool mask. I don't know, Halloween could take on a whole new flavor, I'm guessing. <laughs> okay. Um, so w one of the um, things I've been watching is headlines. And and I'm sure everyone's watching, you know, Facebook came out with a statement and Shopify and Twitter. Um, a lot of them are talking about whether people return to work or, or not, or some variation. Um, one end of the spectrum, Apple said all their staff will return after this settles down because of their product security and their launches. They like to really have this all in one house and very, you know, uh, very much under under lock and key. Um, I think I think Zuckerberg at Facebook had said something like 50 percent is his rough ballpark. He thinks half the staff will come back, half will not. Um, other companies like Shopify had said we're not even going to talk about it till 2021. Forget about it. We'll figure it out later. Um, and Twitter, I think, had put out a, a PR that said, no one's coming back. We're just going to do this forever. So um, I'm, I've also heard of studios in Asia where people are back. They're wearing masks. Mm -hmm. There's stringent protocols for temperature checks and, and uh, cleaning. Um, but they're back in studio, you know, six, seven hundred folks working away on games. So I'm, I'm curious from your individual perspectives, is it possible after the pandemic uh, is either gone or more manageable, um, do we see a larger percentage of employees potentially staying at home or some sort of split? I'm, I'm curious how you how you see that. I think that we're right now we're looking at a, a bit of a combination um, where it's going to be work from home. Ultimately, we want it to be a situation where the staff feel comfortable. So uh, that's probably the biggest piece. You know, when you look at Toronto, it's a big city. We have an awful lot of people that uh, commute in. Uh, the transit is, when you're taking public transit, it's a big deal. And my biggest thing is making sure that they feel that they have a choice and that as long as we're productive, we can stay in the, 
um, in the situation that we have right now. If those that want to come back, we can based on whatever guidelines the, you know, the province and the country, you know, dictate to us. But ultimately, I think that this is going to be the new norm. There will be some sort of hybrid or combo of uh, being in the office and at home. I think that's the future of our industry now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had this feeling at the beginning, if this was a two week sort of thing and we're all back to work, this conversation would have never started. <laughs> you know, it would have been just a blip. But then somewhere, I think around six or seven weeks in when the stores were out of flour, toilet paper, was gone, I thought, oh, no, <laughs> this is this is a lot bigger than just a little blip. So, OK, um, Scarlett, I'm curious in, in your world, too, does it make sense? Uh, do you see it the same way as or, or have have you already had that going on in, in the studio before where maybe this hybrid has already existed? I mean, for us, the bulk of our staff is, or was, sorry, in the office. We did have a handful of people kind of working remotely. And I think for collaboration, I think it does help to have people or somewhat in a near proximity um, to kind of just uh, pitch ideas to, chat it through. So I do think in the long future, after the vaccine is readily available to everyone, um, I do think the it would be preferable for people to be back in the office uh, for us. Um, but I think there will at least be much more flexibility for people that do want to work from home and or having more remote employees. I think that's definitely very feasible. Great, great. Anyone else want to add anything? I, I would agree with, with Scarlett. You know, um, ideally, especially for the creative teams, it's, it's uh, preferable to be together. But, you know, the future is so uncertain, it's, it's really hard to say what that's going to look like until the, vaccines, until the vaccines are kind of out there. Yeah. I, all I can say is that, you know, it, it, we will make sure that our employees feel as safe as possible and, you know, give, give them a choice. Right, right. I, you know, I can recall a training sometimes where we'd have a studio that was either built in departments, so modeling was all together and, and rigging was all together, and then other times where we would switch it where it was more show-based or project-based. And um, I distinctly remember supervisors who had to train new people, and they found the department setting much easier because anyone new would come into the department. They were all in one cluster. They were all the modeling team or the animation team. And so to me, this feels, you know, there's a, a parallel here where if I'm a supervisor and I've got three new people, I've got to recreate that kind of training environment. I've got to find a way of just doing calls together. Uh, you know, otherwise it's, it's a lot of work to do each one individually. So uh, again, these are, I guess things we've done before, it's just the format will be different. And I'm, I'm curious to see what new tools get developed through this because, you know, this is the time when we get really creative and technology will, will pop up, I think, in the next six months that we've never seen because it has to happen, right? We'll see really interesting stuff, I'm sure. Um, curious about security. You know, I've worked in many studios. We've all worked in many studios. And I've done security audits where... Disney has a certain protocol and certain restraints on what can and can't go outside the studio. Disney, just an example. Netflix had a different uh, protocol. Apple TV, when they started, had a different protocol. Um, you know, cameras in certain places, locked issues, uh, locked server rooms. Um, and so ha I'm wondering how studios are managing that. I've heard from a few folks out there. Um, but I'm curious, have you had to take the NDAs home to the family and uh, you know, uh, take a look at the environment that the work's being produced in. I'm curious from your perspectives and your experience, how's that going? Re Rebecca, maybe if you, how's how the cool started on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important for us. We're at the beginning of every project. So I think security is still top of mind. I think that we've all made some adjustments, but it's still it's still the first question that gets asked and it's the first question that gets asked from clients and it's the first question we ask ourselves and it's the first question that we have to ask our staff. 
Um, right. And how do we maintain that line of confidentiality and security? And is it making sure you're in a separate room? Is it making sure that you're on a studio machine or linking in with Teradici on to the studio machine or making sure you're not printing anything. So there's definitely, you know, the discussions of security and an additional level of trust. That's really easy for people that you've been working with for years, going back to that kind of concept of onboarding brand new people. So when we're onboarding brand new people and we're not like Jamfil, we haven't onboarded 200 people, but that becomes a challenge for sure. And that level of trust is something that is new, I think, in terms of having to do that remotely. I don't know if that right. makes sense, but. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Has there been, I, I, I literally, like, I worked in visual effects a few times and uh, I was in operations doing security audits. And so, it was one of these things at the time prior to COVID where it was it was black and white sort of thing. Either this happens or we take the project. Either this happens or you don't get the project. And so I'm, I'm quite curious about the flex. You know, uh, it, it's a new uncharted territory. It could not happen before. Now it has to happen. So Kyle, have you had questions with clients about that and, and had to manage that conversation as well? Definitely. I mean, we just had to make sure that, you know, Everything stays on the servers, so remote remote desktop is the the key solution yeah. um, in place that we that our our staff sort of have to abide by. I mean, uh, outside of that, I mean that's part of the 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 expectation with our with our clients that we do that, and um, it keeps everything in a secure, safe environment. Great. Anybody else? Anyone to add on that? Are we good? All right. So I guess the other question I had was about um, render farms, cloud services. You touched on it a bit there, Kyle. Um, the actual physical remote desktop lag issues or file sizes or rendering, um, you know, probably specifically more with CG than 2D, you know, general statement. Um, but I'm curious, uh, have, have there been real challenges in the physical work getting done because of lag and all the regular sort of things with rendering. I think in a remote setting, like with using remote desktop, I think we're we've we've managed pretty well. We've managed to hit our deliverables. Um, I think that's a big and an important piece. Is just um, it, it was our biggest fear before we made the transition to work from home, and we found that we're able to actually manage it. So uh, it's funny, you know, before this all played out, there's no way we we thought that this would have even been possible. And here we find ourselves uh, actually making it happen. The teams have done an amazing job, the technology teams in, in particular. Um, those support groups have done an amazing job making sure that people have the ability to keep doing what they're doing and getting things across the finish line each week. So it's an amazing thing. Great. All right. Anybody else want to add anything? All good? All right. Um, also curious about after this settles down, if we end up with studios that have primarily brought everyone back to work and other studios that are more flex work, um, do you see it as a recruiting advantage? You know, if I got two offers, this studio offers me more flex time, whereas this one's setup is, is very different. Um, so primarily back to, you know, um, uh, Nicola, how how do you see that? How do you see uh, you know A versus B? If one studio has a more flexible work schedule, do you see that as someone in talent acquisition that's going to have a easier time filling those roles? Absolutely, I think I think it's hugely advantageous to have that flexibility. Um, as someone mentioned earlier, you know prior to this all happening, we were a studio that you know preferred to have people on site and now you know we just released MBA 2k 21 and we proved that we can do it when we're all remote has it been a learning curve absolutely will we get better yes and so you know as far as as recruitment I mentioned earlier we we've been able to widen and reach out to people that we wouldn't normally 
be able to 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 kind of get uh, excited because for one reason or another they may not be able to relocate. So right. I think for studios that have that flexibility for remote working, it's it's huge. It really is huge, and we will get better at it. Right. Right. Great. And. And I guess I have a question, too, about visas, because, you know, this is something we've had to relocate people and manage immigration, lawyer fees, you know, even just the, the physical amount of money to move somebody across country or across state. Um, and some government offices have been furloughed, so it's <laughs> very difficult to even get the paperwork through those offices. Um, so I, I guess that's my curiosity has, if anyone wants to chime in on some of those things related to the you know and we've you just touched on them as well um is is this something that's making it easier to staff movies and projects and games because of the fact that we now no longer have to worry about moving someone internationally or even just uh city to city that's a yes and a no question um from our perspective it's hard for us to be set up with employees in other countries due to uh some tax situations. Right. So for us, it's always better for them to be located either in the state or the country that we do have offices in. Um, in regards to visas, it's that's been quite difficult. Our, our UK office, we've had much better luck with uh, either moving people into the country or honestly much more flexibility if people are out of the country uh, for a period of time, where for our US office, we may We've been in situations where we, we might be losing candidates because we just their consulates aren't open for us to really even have them apply for the visa. Right, right. And and how about just even, I think we might have touched on the other day, uh, the idea of um, some people are very afraid to get on an airplane right now. Um, you know, I've had uh, myself uh, challenges with moving people out of the UK to Canada, the US. Um, based on perceptions of, or, you know, the, the facts and the headlines going on. Um, have you come across those things where people are very hesitant to even entertain an offer right now uh, because of the potential risks? So we, we are extending offers to people that don't want to get on a plane or, or relocate to start with us remotely and when they feel comfortable or when we go back to the office then they can uh you know relocate so we are giving them that option to make you know make that decision easier for them great and uh uh Rebecca, Kyle, in, in Canada, we've got this robust tax system <laughs> and tax credit system. So I would imagine on budgets, that's a challenge as well. You know, Scarlett mentioned it as well. There's, there's different tax breaks. Um, are these things that maybe we need to go back and refigure some budgets here and there because you can now hire someone, not relocate them, so you're saving the money there but losing it on the tax credit? Is that a conversation that's maybe in the wind a bit or no? I would say, you want to take this for a record? You want me to jump in? <laughs> you, you go first. <laughs> I would say that um, based on our situation with the tax credit system in Canada, um, we still hire within our provinces for the projects that they're uh, mandated to, to jump onto, that they're hired for. So um, if you're on a, an Ontario-based production, you're in Ontario. If you're in the East Coast in Halifax, you're, 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 you're going to be from that area. Um, right. So there are still restrictions that we still follow. Um, we need to, it, the one thing that I think is an exciting piece though, is that we're not, um, we're not strangled by our physical space any longer. Like if we were to move back everyone today, we wouldn't fit into the offices that we were already, um, that we have at the moment. So there's a big plus there. I think that's yeah. your big win. I think when you talk about not so much, you know, flying people around, but we had people working for us in Toronto that were commuting two hours uh, each way. So you had some people that would have been on the, the road for four hours a day. Right. And the fact that they get that time back, not only for work, but with their families, for themselves, for their, you know, to improve their health. Um, there's just a, a wonderful, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for people to sort of reclaim some of the back of their time that, you know, that's sort of being carved away a little bit based on where they lived. 
So there's that plus that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Rebecca, similar or other thoughts yeah, on that? I mean, everyone, we're asking ourselves that too. That's gonna be a question that comes up. Um, and just like everything else, you, we just have to kind of keep going day by day. And so the projects that are dependent on that and we wanna foster and grow that Canadian talent, like that is still important, that Ontario talent for us being in Toronto. And I think it also um, provides, again, opportunities of where training becomes really important. And how can we integrate training into our day to day so that we're actually creating more opportunities? And um, I mean, that opens up a whole other can of worms of other things that we're talking about in society right now and providing opportunities to people that don't usually get those opportunities and bringing that to the forefront. And I think that that's the one of the silver linings in all of this. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I can think of, you know, I can think of a few people, various people, that, you know, late on a Friday night, they'd be like, well, I've got to catch the last train or I've got to get a Airbnb. <laughs> Those well, are the options. You know? I, I kind of feel like a little bit of a, a liar right now because I was in the office today and our office is in Toronto and I live in Hamilton. So um, right. I still commuted today. And then I was like, well, I can't do this panel from the office. That would look kind of strange. <laughs> so I made sure I was at home. But it is it is a big deal. Like getting that time back is, is huge. And then being able to be flexible where you're in the studio when you really need to be and you can take advantage of being at home when you do have those commitments with kids or yourself. That... It is having your cake and eating it too a little bit. Yeah. All right. I'm going to take a uh, question from the audience. Thank you. Um, will studios feel more free to vacate downtown or metropolitan cities now with working from home? So if I read into that, I mean, uh, you know, we used to do studies years ago that said if you're going to build a studio, it should be on transit lines. It should be in the downtown core for a lot of factors. Some of the employees didn't have cars at the time. Um, you know, it's quite often a lot of a, generally a, a younger workforce. So if they can walk to work or take the transit to work, um, and there is usually clusters, as we know, in many parts of the city, there's, there'll be five or six studios in a little hub. So um, going back to that audience question, will studios feel more free to vacate that sort of downtown real estate? Does that make sense? What does the panel think on that? I think we're going to be keeping our footprint um, in the city. I think that it's uh, it's a base of operation. It's uh, it's one of those things that for a lot of uh, employers, we have leases in place. You know, you're there for a while anyways. And so the biggest thing is that I'd still like the opportunity to see everyone's face every once in a while. So if the opportunity does present itself that we get through all of this, and people feel safe, that there is still that opportunity to reconnect and come back and see each other in person, which I think um, can't be uh, replaced by, you know, Zoom or any of the other calls that we're doing with Skype or anything else. I think this is a big piece um, for us where that human connection is still an important piece. So I think that will still always be a part of it. So I don't think we'll let it go anytime soon. Right. I, I would agree with that, that, you know, as humans, we, we kind of need each other for the energy and to read the room a bit better than, than over video. So um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what, what we are doing. We're, we're just north of San Francisco. But um, I do believe that, you know, there, there needs to be some kind of hub, some studio base where, you know, people can get together and work. There's going to be choices. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, good. Um, great. Any other thoughts on that? I'm just waiting on another question from the audience. Um, Karen's queuing one up. Uh, <laughs> it's not a question here. Also, so it, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll just. I just want to add one little piece. I think that. I think that people can be uh, reassured that this is going to be a solution that will be in place where remote becomes uh, uh, more of the norm mm -hmm. uh, than what it has been. And I think that people are going to be comfortable um, not having to worry about 
feeling uncomfortable not coming back in right away. I mean, that's that's what everybody's fear, you know, is that am I expected to come back in? I think that if you're paying attention and you're sensitive to the needs of the people that work for you and your staff is your studio, you know, that's um, it's one of those things. So if they're in a situation where they will, you know, they have the ability to perform at home and they want to stay at home, then we want to help support that. Right. Right. Good. And another question that came up recently uh, was, uh, you know, imagine you're a property management firm. You have, I don't know, 30 properties in the downtown core. The vacancy rate is now climbing. Um, and would you pivot as a business to say, I don't know, every fifth or 10th floor in one of those office towers is a destination of some point, like a childcare uh, service, or they add other things like, um, reduced fee dental office slash whatever. So you can bring, you know, rather than having to leave the office or have a major commute to get to all these different things, as well as bring the kids to work, drop them off on one floor, pick them up at the end of the day. I just think it outside the box. Does that make sense? That kind of thinking of, of revamping commercial real estate into value add services um, where, because, you know, as we know, this is a big challenge with a lot of people's commutes. If they do have children is husband drops the kids off in the morning, wife picks them up later. That's, you know, all those flex schedules that some places have been managing. Um, does that make sense? Do you think that we could revamp downtown cores into, uh, having more services rather than have to leave the core, get home, run and pick up your dog at this place and your child at that place and all the things we do to kind of scramble. Any thoughts on that? You're trying to get us to solve a lot in one evening. <laughs> well, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour. We've got eight minutes. I thought I'd just throw that out there, but you know, we could always uh, pick that up some other time if it's <laughs> way outside the box. Uh, I'll uh, wrap this up um, and and introduce Karen back if she's got any um, taffy notes that she wants to add. Uh, I, I've really appreciated the discussion tonight. Thank you all for participating and thank you to the audience for posting some questions. Um, everyone on the panel is on LinkedIn. I think if anyone wants to hunt some of you down with a, an in-mail or something to ask a question, I'm sure you get them many ways and you'll be able to stick handle whatever comes your way so if there was a question that popped up that we didn't ask tonight or didn't get to by all means people can probably uh you know find you online and and ask those questions as well so thank you again karen did you want to jump in for a second with any final thoughts from taffy it is oh last thing too it is a fundraiser uh taffy normally uh generates revenue during the year with uh, job fairs and a number of other sort of in-person and uh, uh, events and meetups and those sort of things. So if you, if anyone wanting want, wants to, you can uh, uh, click on the button and uh, donate some money as well to the cause and so on. Uh, Karen, anything else to add? Uh, uh, nothing much to add to the conversation. I just want to thank you, Lance, and to all the panelists for joining our Taffy audience tonight and for sharing your expertise on this project, on this topic, sorry. Okay. Um, um, I just want to also take a second to say, I know we had some technical difficulties in the beginning, mm -hmm. so I'd just like to thank again our Taffy sponsor, Switch Animation. The trailer you saw at the beginning is for Switch Animation's upcoming series, The Perfect Project, whose purpose is to promote the positive reception and perception of autism. The series is presently in development. And Switch is an award-winning, artist-owned boutique studio with decades of experience looking to work on inspired projects like with like-minded partners interested in creating exceptional work. And that's partners in both production opportunities and artist recruitment. So to close off, we've drawn a lucky winner of a Taffy Pass. So are you ready? I'm excited, Karen, tell us, drum roll. Right. <laughs> the winner of the Taffy Pass to our digital conference, Taffy Industry, which is coming up this upcoming November is Catherine Weidman. Woo! <laughs> 
So Catherine, if you could please email outreach at taffy.com, we can get you set up with a free digital pass to our conference, Taffy Industry. For all everyone else who didn't win tonight, tickets do go on sale very soon. Please sign up for our newsletter at taffy.com to stay informed on all our events. Great. Thanks again, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Bye Thank for now. You. Thank you. Thank you.